The aircraft in the team are a P-40E Kitty Hawk flown by Ray Hanna, a P-51D Mustang flown by Nigel Lamb, a Spitfire Mark 9 piloted by Lee Proudfoot and an FG-1D Corsair. behind the display the fighters fly. We try to present the aircraft as closely as is possible to the way they would have been flown operationally. Obviously we can't shoot guns and have proper dogfights but we, we try to fly them um, with a certain style showing close formation and tail chasing which, which, was, which would be a very interesting way to see the aircraft. Flying these aircraft in formation is not an easy task because, as Cliff Spink explains, each has its own handling characteristics which needs to be respected. It's particular challenge with these four aeroplanes because they're all different. So you've got different weights, different wings, different engine powers, just about everything that could be different is different. So it's quite a challenge for, say, the leader because instead of just put it setting a power, if he had four similar aeroplanes around him, he has to be conscious of all the time, not only getting his line right on the ground, but also getting his power setting right. Now for the Spitfire on the left wing, he's got a wonderfully agile aeroplane, big wing, uh, but he can be quite, he's quite a light aeroplane, so going downhill, he can be quite challenged because he tends to run out of a little bit of power. It's the opposite for the uh, Mustang on the right wing, he's got a, quite a, high performance wing but it, it tends to lose out at the slower speeds and so he's he's quite challenged when the airplane is getting slow. For me in the number four position I've got an airplane which actually flies pretty well fast and slow but it's very heavy and it's got a radial engine and so we've got to be very conscious about not over boosting the engine going up the hill. Equally with a radial engine you can't have the propeller driving the engine uh, as you would say changing down in a car because you run the bearings dry very quickly. The aircraft are all very very interesting to fly. The Mustang the Mustang's great. I, I really enjoy flying the Mustang. It's a very very beautiful handling aeroplane. It's very different to for example the Spitfire um, but it's one can one can see the sort of generation change of, of, of aircraft technology and the, the leap forward um, for what the, what the Mustang was designed to do and um, it's, it's very nice, nice handling airplane. I think you have to bring all your skills, handling skills, all together in one position. You're close to the ground, which is very dynamic. You're having to be very precise, but also very, um, in some ways, you have to be very firm on the controls. You've got to keep it trimmed. You're trying to be smooth. Everything about it brings it all into this type of aviation. So low-level formation aerobatics uh, is is absolutely thrilling, particularly when you get it right. Trying to cut the corner, yeah. trying to cut the corner, but there's nothing to cut a corner on because he's actually well, so close. Yeah, so you need to you need to back off in the tail chase. Yeah, If you fly too close, actually you can interfere with the other aeroplane. So you can actually fly too close, and he can feel you. Unlike a jet aeroplane, which doesn't have a great big turning piece of metal, a propeller on the front, they can really tuck up. I've got a tremendous Hamilton standard propeller sitting on the front of my engine and the last thing my leader would want me to do is start gnawing away at his tailplane with my propeller. So I've got to be very, very conscious of that. Certainly in England and much of Europe, there's a huge proportion of the population that's very, very air-minded. And so it's great to be able to keep these aeroplanes flying and operating so that those people can also enjoy the history of them. But also I think it's very important to just keep presenting things which have 
huge historical merit. There are some who would say, you know, they're rare aeroplanes, let's put them into a museum. And Well, I think there are still enough to keep flying. They're living. And I think actually if you, if you keep an aeroplane flying, people lavish obviously that much more care on it. It has to have a certificate of airworthiness. Getting dusty in, in museums is not my idea. I mean, they're essential, obviously, in certain, and there's some wonderful museums. But I think that balance of having these aeroplanes flying, to keep it dynamic, and I think it's important for the public as well to see these aeroplanes which were involved, let's face it, in, in a, one hell of a conflict in their minds. The Mustang is very, very, it has a special place for me because my father was shot down in, uh, on the September the 9th, 1944, um, in Holland by a flak barge. He was a squadron commander in the Royal Air Force flying Mustang 3s. And um, he was uh, slightly burnt, saved by the Dutch resistance, taken to a doctor, watched the Americans capture a bridge, went to the Americans, presented himself and was back on his squadron in two weeks. So, and I've been able to fly very close to that spot. So uh, it's, 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 it's very special. One of the things that flying the, and going around Europe, I had again the privilege of meeting these old chaps who were then young chaps who actually flew these aeroplanes. And while it's tremendous for me to be able to fly it today, they actually fought these aeroplanes. And it's a very humbling experience to speak to them because without exception, they're so modest about their achievements. Even the aces who say they were there to do a job, but obviously took tremendous courage to get into these aeroplanes and flying fight uh, every day. So you begin to live the experience. So uh, I, the whole thing, all wrapped together, makes it a challenge, living history, great experience, great privilege.